Siang Pak Hadi, gimana kabarnya? Baik, sehat Pak, syukur. Nuhun udah dibantu ini. Dan nggak saya ikut, ikut hadir lah. <laughs> <laughs> ya, pertama kali kita mengadakan International Conference dalam kaitan komputer nih Pak, informatika. Nah, bagus sekali Pak, Pak Hadi. Saya iya. sangat gembira. Iya. Ya mudah-mudahan bisa berlangsung terus. Amin, amin, amin. Gimana Bapak, sehat Pak? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Meskipun kalau dari wajah saya ini, minggu ini lagi kecapean banget ini. <laughs> Sama pakai itu, pakai masker tuh kelihatannya. <laughs> ya kalau ini aktivitas di luar, Hmm. masker terus lah gitu. ya 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 Enggak. ya jaga kesehatan we ya kita sama-sama pak Badi juga sehat-sehat selalu ya iya pak ini juga uh, ya online ini ada man, ada untungnya ada ya, ya. ruginya ya kita nggak pernah ketemu muka nih apalagi dengan para mahasiswa ya senin kemarin udah mulai itu yang praktikum iya pak kalau di kita masih belum karena masih memungkinkan online tapi kalau oh, gitu, ya. prodi lain itu geologi susah online oh, oh jelas Pak itu butuh psikomotorik kan geologi iya, betul bisa kompetensinya susah di, di membayangkan membayangkan mah bahaya bahaya <laughs> Mangga, ya, juga ini terima kasih nih atas nama Universitas ya, Pak Hadi. Iya Pak. Ini kebetulan dosen-dosen muda, mahasiswa yang semangat, ya syukurlah Pak yang hmm. melakukan ini. Kita mute dulu Pak ya. Iya iya iya. Baik, uh, selamat siang. Good afternoon to the Honorable Chair of the IEEE Communication Society, Indonesia Chapter, Dr. Wisato Agung, Vice Rector for Research and Innovation, Prof. Dr. I.R. Hendra Mawan, MSc, ICAI BDA General Chair, Dr. Intan Nurma Yulita, MT, the Honorable Keynote Speakers, Professor Boris Merkin, from National Research University Higher School of Economics, Moscow RF, and Birkbeck University of London, UK. Dr. Mahardika Pratama, from Nanyang Technological University, Singapore, and all participants. Thank you for attending today's event on time. As we are about to begin, please be seated. To all participants, I want to encourage you all to turn off your microphone and put your camera on. Kindly put on the virtual background and thank you for your kind cooperation. My name is Marcia Stephanie Manuru and I will be the master of ceremony for today's event. On behalf of ICA BDA 2021 Day One Committee, we are pleased to welcome all of you today to the first international conference on artificial intelligence and big data analytics, or as known as ICAI BDA 2021 on Wednesday, October 27, 2021 at online Zoom forum. As we are about to begin, let us open today's event with our national anthem, Indonesia Raya. To all participants, please kindly cooperate with proper position and to sing in honor on our national anthem. To the committee, please.
Thank you to the committee. Before we start today's event, we will start with a prayer according to each other's beliefs. As we come together today, we gave our thanks for the God gave us. Pray begin. Pray finished. May our activity run well from start to finish without any obstacle at all and provide tremendous benefits for all. Now we will have a welcoming speech from the chair of the IEEE Communication Society, Indonesia chapter, Dr. Wiseto Agung. The time is yours. Thank you, Mbak Marcia. Honorable Vice Rector for Research and Innovation of Universitas Pajajaran, Professor Hendar Mawan, IC, ICA, IBDA Chair, Dr. Intan Yulita, distinguished keynote speakers, participants, all at IEEE College, ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon. First of all, on behalf of IEEE Communication Society Indonesia chapter, I would like to welcome you to the first international conference on artificial intelligence and big data analytics or ICA IBDA 2021. Despite the hard time due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we should be grateful that this event, the ICA IBDA 2021, can be held virtually. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce a bit about IEEE Communication Society or COMSOC Indonesia chapter. IEEE Communication Society Indonesia chapter has conducted many activities over 16 years in Indonesia. And we have contributed and sponsored about 10 different international conferences annually. In terms of collaboration, IEEE Comsoc Indonesia chapter has a good and mutual relationship with ICT organizations, industries, universities, as well as with the government of Indonesia. Besides this, we also conduct some other activities such as public lectures, technical gatherings, workshops, and so on. Our next event is a virtual distinguished lecturer program on the 30th of October, this Saturday, with topic connecting space assets to the internet, where the speaker is Professor Atiku Zaman from Oklahoma University. All of you are kindly invited to join, and I will send the details later on. Ladies and gentlemen, on this occasion, I would like also to share some interesting opinion from one of the IEEE senior members, Professor Roberto Saraco. He is also a futurist regarding the post-pandemic scenarios. He observed several things. First, during the pandemic, the use of digital access for remote access, as well as to access companies, are increased significantly. Second, is that once the containment restrictions have been released or loosened, the use of digital channels has decreased, but not to the point they were before the pandemics, remaining somewhere around 80%. Besides this, I would like to share also another interesting data. According to the Harvard Business Review or SBR article September last month, AI or artificial intelligence adoption skyrocket over the last 18 months, where the digital innovation spurred by COVID-19 has put AI and analytics at the center of business operation. AI and analytics are boosting productivity, delivering new products and services, accentuating corporate values, addressing supply chain issues, and fueling new startups. So from those data and observation, it can be seen that our field in the technology research include the focus of this conference that related to the digital as well as AI and data analytics 
has positive and significant impact to the society. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, finally, I would like to thank and congratulate the organizing committee of this event, Universitas Pajajaran, for smart and hard work. Despite the uneasy time because of the pandemic, this conference can be held successfully. Also, I would like to express my gratitude to all keynote speakers for supporting this event. And for all of you, please enjoy the conference. And I do hope that our research results would give a more positive impact to the industry ecosystem and to our society in the near future. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Viseto Agung, for the welcoming speech. Next up, we will have a welcoming speech from the Vice Rector for Research and Innovation, Prof. Dr. E.R. Hendramawan, MSc. The time is yours. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. The Honorable, uh, the Chair of IEEE Communication Society, Indonesian Chapter, uh, yang terhormat Bapak Dr. Wiseto Agung, the Honorable, all key speaker, Professor Mirkin Boris, and also Dr. Mahardika Pratama. The uh, Honorable uh, Invited Presenter, the uh, Honorable uh, Ketua Pusat Riset Kecerdasan Artificial and Big Data, Universitas Pajaran, Bu uh, Intan Nurmayu Yulita PhD, dan uh, juga tidak lupa, ah, to my close college, Dr. Setiawan Hadi, and then uh, the Honorable, the invitees, and all participants. First of, first of all, praise be to Allah, we can meet here to do scientific activities. And today I'm very happy on this opportunity. I would like to express my highest gratitude an appreciation to uh, Dr. Intan as the head of the uh, research center who uh, invited me and was given the opportunity for me to give a speech. I think as we know that uh, the need uh, for technology in all aspects of uh, human life become a necessity to, to obtain uh, convenience, efficiency, and also uh, high productivity in all aspects. So this uh, conference is very appropriate to foster a variety of creativity and also innovation. I believe that through this conference, there are so many useful things. We can exchange idea and grow uh, in inspiration so that it is clear that what to do after this meeting, it, that is very important. I will not talk long in this speech. Uh, I would like to say, have a good discussion and get a good result to all participants. I apologize if there are some mistake in my speech. Thanks a lot up again to the organize, organizer of committee for this conference. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hendra Mawan, for the welcoming speech. Next, we will have a welcoming speech from ICAIBDA General Chair, 
Dr. Intan Nurma Yulita, MD. The time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to the chair of the IEEE Communication Society Indonesia Chapter, Dr. Wiseto Agung, the Vice Rector for Research and Innovation Universitas Pajajaran, Professor Dr. Hendarmawan, the Vice Dean of Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Science Universitas Pajajaran, Yudi Andriana, PhD, the Head of Department of Computer Science Universitas Pajajaran, Dr. Stiwan Hadi, our honorable speakers, Professor Boris Mirkin, Dr. Mahardika Pratama, Associate Professor Norma Alias, Professor Adi Wijaya, Professor Nur Iriawan, PSD, Associate Professor Wan Muhammad Amir, Associate Professor Gos Ankus. On behalf of the organizing committee of this international conference on artificial intelligence and big data analytics, we are pleased to welcome all of you our very first international conference. This international conference is organized by the IEEE Communication Society, Indonesia Chapter, the Research Center for Artificial Intelligence and Big Data, the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Science, and also Informatic Engineering Student Association, Universitas Pajajaran. And is intended to be the first step toward a talk conference on artificial intelligence, big data, and communication. We believe that this international conference will give opportunities for sharing and exchanging original research ideas and opinions, gaining impression for future research, and broadening knowledge about various fields in advanced artificial intelligence, big data, and communication amongst members of Indonesian research communities together with researchers from China, Bangladesh, Turkey, Japan, Philippines, Russia, Singapore, and Malaysia. This conference focuses on the development of artificial intelligence, big data, and communication. Along with three keynotes and five invited speech, this conference will present 56 papers, which have been selected from a total of 107 papers from six different countries. We also want to express our sincere appreciation to the member of the program committee for the critical review of the submitted papers, as well as the organizing committee for the time and energy they have devoted to arranging the logistic of holding this conference. We will also like to give appreciation to the author who have submitted their excellent work to this conference. Last but not least, we would like to extend our gratitude to the IEEE Communication Society Indonesia Chapter, Director of Universitas Pajajaran, the Dean of Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Science, the Head of Department of Computer Science, Informatic Engineering Student Association Universitas Pajajaran, for their continuous support throughout the conference. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Ibu Intan Nurma Yulita, for the welcoming speech. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived at the main session of the event. The title of today's session from our keynote speakers are Methods for Taxonomic Content Analysis of Text Collection by our first keynote speaker and Continual and Autonomous Machine Learning by our second keynote speaker. To begin our main session, let me introduce Dr. Satyawan Hadi, MSCCS, as our moderator today. To the committee, can you help me share the screen for Mr. Satyawan City? Okay, I think uh, it's enough. I think uh, we'll start the presentation of Professor Boris Mirkin. Uh, introduce myself. My name is Tiawan Hadi, and, and now I am the moderator for the two keynote speakers, Professor Boris Mirkin and Dr. Mahardika Pratama. Now uh, we have Professor Boris Mirkin the, that will give the talk entitled Method for Taxonomic Content Analysis of Text Collections. 
Before that, let me read the curriculum vitae of Professor Boris Mirkin. Professor Boris Mirkin is a tenured professor of Department of Data Analysis and Machine Intelligence, HSE University in Moscow, Russia. He is also Professor Emeritus of Department of Computer Science and Information Systems, Birkbeck Birk Birk University of London. His research interest is in mathematical models and al algorithms for visualization, data mining, knowledge discovery in text, and many more, including mixed-scale data analysis. He has published about 20, uh, 75 publications in the top journals, such as pattern recognition. So we will straight to, the, to hear the Professor Boris presentation now. Uh, OK. Here is Professor Boris Mirkin. Times is yours. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, of course, <laughs> to start, I would pass you our Russian welcomes to your uh, country, with which we feel a kind of uh, affinity, starting from uh, 60, 70 years ago of the spirit of Bandung and similar. Uh, I probably you cannot imagine now we have zero outside. Oh, I, I have a screen, but this, besides me, it's my window. So there's a zero outside. I'm still uh, yeah, happy to participate in this conference. Uh, before I start my technical report, I would like to uh, give a few general comments on uh, the place of my research in uh, artificial intelligence. Currently, the area of artificial intelligence is dominated by uh, what is called uh, deep learning. Deep learning is an area devoted to using uh, multi-layer artificial neural systems, neural networks to learn uh, specified relations in a huge uh, arrays of data. And this is uh, quite successful. This research helps to translate between languages much better than any NLP techniques or uh, conceptually characterize images. However, the, there is a flaw in this system. The neural networks form the deep, deep neural networks form deep down features of the observed data that they don't supply. The people behind this network don't know what features are formulated. And these are very deep features, very useful. However, uh, research shows that these features sometimes are not transferable. They can be uh, unsubstantial. And if you change just a little bit in those images that the human eye cannot recognize, the system would uh, break its working record and will show everything wrong. Uh, so these are much unstable and non-transferable configurations. So my research, uh, how to say, my research is based on a, just an opposite principle. Instead of formulating deep down features by myself, I use features uh, formulated by human experts specializing in the domain of which goes. 
so the, my, my basis, the base of my research is a taxonomy of the uh, domain, of the specific domain we are using for this. And uh, uh, further on, so I'm using this collected wisdom of the humans to, to proceed. So with this, I'm starting demonstration of my screen. So my face <laughs> cannot be seen anymore. Uh, I think, yeah, I can make it a show. Okay, uh, so this method uh, has been developed uh, for the past probably 15 years by an international team, including people from Bergbeck, London. It's my colleague, colleague Professor Trevor Fenner, Dr. Susana Nascimento from Portugal, and also members of my team in Moscow. So currently this is a list of my students who were participating in this research. Uh, and what uh, maybe it would be useful for academics here to know that my university, High School of Economics, financially supports teams of students led by a professor so this, my teams received 2 million rubles, not that much. It's about, uh, about $25,000 uh, for two years. It's uh, not for equipment, only for some salary. Now the contents of my talk, uh, First, I tell uh, the motivation behind it, and then the method, the technical parts of the method, as you can see, it consists of five uh, stages, finding a taxonomy or building a taxonomy, computing a quantitative matrix to connect text with concepts, then finding fuzzy clusters of the topics in the taxonomy according to the uh, publications. And then uh, my basic step, this generalization, it's a, a, a so we have a, our own model for mental, for conceptual generalization. I think it's unique. I've never seen anything like this in the international literature. And then conceptualization of the results of this uh, lifting generalization within the taxonomy. Then I will tell you uh, some results of application of these techniques. Then I will tell you how uh, uh, similar issues would be treated by four other approaches in the literature and uh, explain that my results are much superior and then coming to conclusion. So first what I need to develop this technique, I need two things. First is a text collection, so collection of texts. In our example, we took 17 Springer journals in data science. Uh, this was done in, in 2017, beginning 2018, when these data were not available. So I thank the Springer publisher for their generosity in providing us with these 17 journals. Uh, and we downloaded about 17,000 uh, abstracts. Unfortunately, our text analysis techniques are uh, computationally intensive and we cannot uh, process 
papers themselves in reasonable time. Currently, we are updating this research and we found 58 Springer journals on data science, and now they are available publicly. So we are going during this winter to replicate this research with some other, with the techniques developed here and some updates of this technique. So this is a collection of texts that we have. The second, oh no, now what is the challenge? So what we go, what we want, what do we want from this? We want to provide a brief description, a half page, a page for this 17,000 abstracts. We want to present it to a high level administrator to explain what's going on in data science. And I know of different ways for doing that computationally. The first is the content analysis techniques developed back, uh, uh, I would say, in the very beginning of the uh, computer era in 60s. Then summarization of text. Then the analysis of graphs, of co-citation, a mutual citation. Then a very popular, uh, back 10 years ago, topic modeling technique. And now the taxonomy content analysis, which I'm reporting of here. So the, these four techniques I will be talking of later in the end of my talk. Uh, by the way, I started 10 minutes earlier, so I've, I'm going to finish 15 minutes earlier too. Some, so I'm considering that my talk should be about 15 minutes. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to explain you the approach number five developed by our team. So what this taxonomy content analysis, it's a repetition of the same, of the same, uh, 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 of the same uh, uh, stages that I, I was explaining already in the beginning. So first, find the taxonomy of the domain. Then take, so taxonomy is just a rooted tree of concepts. Concepts, uh, and the higher the concept is, it is the more general it is. The, it covers the contents of this uh, uh, leaf concept of, of, the, of the concept the contents of uh, a concept connected to uh, associated with a node in the tree is more general than its offspring concepts along the taxonomy tree. So we use only leaf concepts as the units in our analysis. Then we compute the relevance matrix between papers and between concepts, between the topics, the leaf topics. And then we find fuzzy clusters because it's semantics. So we need some fuzziness here. Uh, it's, uh, so the leaves fall into the same cluster if they fall in the same papers. So the more papers, two concepts appear in, the better is connection between them, the more likely they fall into the same cluster. Then we apply our operation of generalization. We lift optimally this cluster to a, head, to a higher ranks in the taxonomy. And then we conceptualize the results. So this, uh, uh, what we did, how we built our taxonomy of data science. We took what is referred to as ACM 
CCS, Association for Computing Machinery, uh, Computing, the Classification of Computing Subjects. It was developed pretty uh, quite uh, uh, long ago, I would say, in 2012 by humans. The previous version was developed in 1998, 14 years before. So we are looking for a time scale about 14 years to get this taxonomy updated. In my computation, it's about 2026. I expect this uh, system would be updated. However, some currently there are some automatic systems working rather pro quite uh, properly, I would say. Maybe uh, the issue of building a taxonomy could be automated before, I don't know. Anyway, we took that taxonomy of computer science, and this is a, a most well recognized authority in the world of computation. So we took that taxonomy and left and removed everything not related to data science. And we obtained a four layer taxonomy. And on this slide, I show you uh, two upper levels. So we have a theory of computation and it has only one child, which contradicts to the concept of a tree uh, as a mathematical object. You, you don't need a father if it has only one child in, 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 uh, in the theory of mathematical hierarchies. However, it appears these are quite important because they show different levels of, uh, uh, of generality. So we keep this, even mathematics of computing, also only one child, and so forth. Uh, so this is what we have, so five, five uh, categories on, this, uh, on the first layer, and each has a number of children. And now I'm showing you leaf subjects of our taxonomy. So I took data mining, which was very popular in 2012, not anymore. And you see here that there are some leaves, it's the fifth level, that are labeled with stars. Whatever is labeled with star is added by us, ourselves, according to the uh, contents of the abstracts that we have to analyze. So as you can see, there is, uh, there are quite, a, uh, I would say, quite a number of additions, like big clustering, consensus clustering, so the original taxonomy contains just clustering. And we put seven categories because there are different papers dedicated to each of them. Uh, however, we are not that uh, thorough in areas where I'm not a specialist. For instance, uh, this is a different branch of the tree. And you can see we added nothing. Nothing is added here, just four levels as, as it is, uh, 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 as it is uh, uh, defined in the system of uh, ACM, Association for Computing Machinery. So this taxonomy has 317 leaves. And this taxonomy has been published and it is uh, uh, available for use. So after we selected this taxonomy, we build a matrix. 
showing the relevance of every leaf topic to every abstract in our collection. And for this, we use a kind of in-house method uh, developed with my participation in Birkbeck. Uh, this was a research uh, ordered by the Home Office. Home Office of the United Kingdom is a, a, how to say, police department within the government. And they wanted us to, uh, to automatically select experts for any case they encounter. So we developed this based on the uh, annotated suffix tree uh, technology. The suffix tree technology has been developed for, uh, uh, for kind of uh, sparingly storing texts. And we added uh, to this just a, a, uh, annotation with frequencies. With frequencies, how frequently this or that substring of the text uh, occurs. And this uh, technique is quite useful and, and quite convenient to apply. And it works quite well. I had a PhD student here in Russia with whom we provided several uh, comprehensive experiments to show this technique uh, quite workable. Uh, and uh, uh, basically superior to other techniques uh, for text analysis. Well, this is an example. So if you have a string like A, B, C, B, A, then you first uh, uh, see what are the different letters occurring here and put them all on the first layer. And then you see all the strings, substrings starting from A, all strings starting from B, and you count how many times this letter occurs in those substrings. This is how it works. After you build it for this string, you take another string and update these three. So it's, uh, uh, it's, it's more or less uh, fast, but not enough fast uh, to process paper text because we use letters, symbols, not words for the analysis. What is nice in these techniques that it requires no preliminary analysis of text. And also it admits any errors because it is based on a kind of cumulative frequencies of fragments of substrings. And uh, uh, several papers have been published about this. So we, we, we built this uh, rectangular topic to text relevance matrix. Then we convert it to topic to topic for relevance matrix. We apply what is referred to the Laplacian normalization. Uh, it's a technique that sharpens the cluster structure in similarity matrices. And then we do fuzzy clustering in the space of eigenvectors. And such techniques have been developed uh, by Belkin and collaborators and also by us. Uh, this paper is published in Information Sciences and we beat, uh, we showed that uh, it was working better than competing techniques. Uh, a few words, how we build the correlevance matrix. Uh, basically, it is, uh, uh, it is just uh, that this rectangular matrix is multiplied by its, uh, uh, by its uh, transpose. 
However, we put some weights. We put some weights uh, which are inversely proportional to the number of relevant subjects. So each of our 17,000 abstracts appears to be relevant to one, two, three, or more subjects. What does it mean to be relevant? It's an experimental value. We experimentally found out that we have a kind of threshold that whenever the relevance as we compute with our technology is less than two tenths, then it is irrelevant. And here what we have that among our texts, a sizable proportion, 7%, are irrelevant at all. And in the further studies, if you have such a situation, we look what subjects these texts are devoted to. And we should update the taxonomy with those subjects. However, this was the first research we did. And so we did not do anything. We just removed this well-handed texts that are irrelevant. However, there are 800 that are relevant to 12 or more of, of, of the subjects. Uh, the, out of 300, of course, it's not that much, but still. Uh, and what we think that the greater the number of relevant subjects, the less important is the paper. So the real deep papers should be about a few subjects. This, of course, is easy to argue. However, this is how we did. And this is a few words of our technique for finding a fuzzy cluster. So fuzzy cluster, number T, oh, sorry, it's not number T, it's, it's so the, it's the longingness of text T to this cluster. Oh, sorry, T is a topic. T is a topic and uh, the model is this that the similarity between T and T prime as we observe it should be proportional to the product of the memberships of these two topics. So this is the uh, core of the method that we develop uh, within what is referred to the spectral approach. However, in the spectral approach, they find minimum angular values and within this approach, the, the, it's maximum eigenvalues. So to make these two uh, consistent, we apply uh, the not only Laplacian transformation, but also pseudo inverse Laplacian transformation. And with this, we found six fuzzy clusters, and three of them appear to be nonsensical to us. We could not understand what they were about, uh, probably because of the lack of journals. We took only 17 journals, so not all the topics are covered. And also because of some noise in our method, it's based in exception, exceptionally is based on, on a syntactic information not on semantic. Uh, anyway, we were happy that we uh, uh, obtained these uh, three clusters. Uh, here I show what is good about uh, this uh, pseudo inverse Laplacian transformation. This is a most popular uh, data set 
consisting of two clusters that no ordinary technique can recover. The human eye sees this Dunga. very well. What, uh, uh, was it a question or no? Okay, so the human eye can see this uh, on the left two clusters very well, but no ordinary technique can recover them. Because a method like k-means, it works on, uh, uh, on distances. And the distances within this circle, the second circle, can be very large. However, after you apply to this data, this pseudo inverse transformation, you obtain two very tight clusters. These two clusters are converted with this transformation. So you first take this uh, L is the Laplacian transformation, and then you take the pseudo inverse. Why pseudo inverse? Because this L is singular. It is singular uh, so that uh, uh, you need to remove the eigenvectors related to zero eigenvalues. Uh, and this transformation transform this data set into two very tight clusters. And just to show that it does sharpen the cluster structure. So here are uh, tables showing the contents of our clusters. So cluster L about learning, and you, you can see all the words here contain this learning as a part of them. And these are the codes in our uh, five layer classification. Fifth layer is usually added by, uh, by us. So the clustering also is based, uh, it, well, it has music retrieval here or language models. Data, so it's a, a bit less, less homogeneous. Still, most elements here are clustering. And the database views come here. Uh, I don't know, because of the contents of these abstracts. But the language frequently uses this clustering. Uh, the technologies. And this is uh, uh, part of the retrieval cluster. Belongingness greater than 1500 are presented here. Here you can see with mostly representations, uh, segmentation. And this retrieval cluster, you see, Usually when we discuss retrieval, uh, we, 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 we assume the text mostly, but here we can see a lot of uh, image as well. Now I'm coming to our model for uh, generalization. This is a very uh, complex, I would say, word of English. And it has many meanings of which the most popular are very different from the meaning that we have uh, picked up. So if you take the Merriam-Webster, as we did, this is a kind of, uh, I would say, the, the law. Merriam-Webster is the law in international English language. So among other meanings, we can see two meanings. 
to give a general form to, or to derive a general conception from particulars. And this second meaning is exactly the meaning that we are using in this research. So let me introduce you uh, slowly <laughs> to, to the concept because uh, uh, you, you see other concepts in computer sciences, you can refer to other research. Uh, here, although I started this back in, in uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, nobody uh, actually is doing anything like this. So I have to start from the beginning to so the people get intuition on the concepts. So consider uh, a fragment of a taxonomy like this. And consider a crisp subset, including all A's and B1. And this is uh, uh, what analog to a cluster of topics that we obtain. So what we want is to generalize, find a more general concept that tightly covers this. And we have two choices. Either we pick up A as the general concept, but then we miss B1, or we can take the root. Then we cover all these concepts, but then we get all C and a few B as a kind of unwanted addition. They don't belong to our cluster, but they are covered by the root and thus must be considered as parts. So if I accept that A is, so we have basically, and there are, uh, kind of arguments for each of the choices. If I take this A, then I can say that, okay, I disregard B1. This is just an offshoot, uh, which randomly, absolutely unnecessary came here because of some computational stuff. So in this way, we get, this concept of offshoot and gap. We obtain gap if we accept uh, that the head subject is the root. So we get several gaps in the concept that don't belong to our cluster. And we have offshoot if we accept this the immediate, then we have one gap in this offshoot here with this picture. So this uh, I'm uh, explaining basically that we, we encounter two types of errors where we want to generalize. That one error is gap and the other is offshoot and they are analogous to errors of the first and the second type in statistics. So if we accept that there are different penalties for a gap, lambda, it's loss, and offshoot is a gain, gamma, then what we want, we want to find out the head subject that minimizes this penalty. So one is for the introducing of the head subject itself. And sometimes it is not enough to have one head subject. If a tree is quite uh, uh, complex, like in our case, then we may need sometimes several head subjects. So this is the penalty and this is what we want to minimize. So this uh, way we behave uh, 
over the principle of maximum parsimony. Maximum parsimony, it's a, it's a kind of scientific expression of the principle of simplicity. The English and Americans say that it uh, uh, goes back to uh, a monk, Ockham, uh, Ockham, sorry, Ockham. Well, uh, that, that he was a monk. There is nothing, uh, uh, no, 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 nothing, uh, because uh, all the science was uh, being developed in, in the monasteries at that time. So this Ockham, he said something which a person cannot translate into the principle of simplicity, but this is the principle of simplicity. Currently, we have developed a, a better principle, maximum likelihood. And the maximum likelihood scientifically is more acceptable. However, it is based on probabilities. And we have two different ways to introduce probabilities here. And we are still in doubts. Both seem a little bit. Uh, so what I'm talking today of is of the principle of maximum parsimony. We minimize the number of, uh, of additional concepts needed to explain our cluster, to explain the generalization that we found the head subjects, and I, I probably did not, yeah, it's here. So the, the, what we are looking for, the general, general, general uh, node is what we call head subject. So depending on the relation between penalties, lambda and gamma, either A or B can be optimum. So to make uh, a long thing uh, faster, oh, I don't have that much time. Uh, you still have 15 here, minutes. Here is a general expression for this penalty function. I'm not going to explain you all the technicalities here. It would take another half, to half hour. But uh, what I'm proud of, and I can boast, is that we have an algorithm, a recurrent algorithm from uh, the bottom, from the leaves going up one layer at a time uh, to minimize this function globally. So we minimize it globally, and uh, we are quite happy with this. And we have developed a software which is uh, available. I had a PhD student, uh, Dmitry Frolov, who did all this. And it's all available uh, publicly. So here I'm showing you the lifting of cluster learning. And this around, this circular, big circular of nodes are the head subjects. So we have three subjects, three head subjects here. And other elements are these uh, gaps and offshoots and whatever. I've just, I've just shown to only for one cluster. So I'm giving you a page long description of the 17,000 abstract according to our method. So the, according to those, the conceptualization is this, that main work here, still on theory and method, not many applications. Uh, well, it's the papers from 98 to 2017. And the flourishing of deep learning comes at about uh, exactly after 2017. 
and it is expanding from learning subsets and partitions to learning ranks and rankings, collaborative filtering. And still many areas are not covered by publications, which is probably because out of 58 journals, we took only 17. Information system, we have two head subjects, sorry, information retrieval, two head subjects, information systems and computer vision. So it's first of all, text management in information systems. And the second is moving from text to images and video and ways for structuring the visual information to produce a semantic, a semantic hierarchy for images, which is in the very beginning. So for the next 50 years, I think this last is uh, the kind of way to go for image analysis, is developing structures uh, of a type of word net for images. Clustering is the easiest because it's got 16 head subjects, which we interpret that it is still in auxiliary roles and it should be raised to higher ranks as a bigger concept related to classification, to knowledge engineering, and so forth. And I have an idea how to do this within this framework of generalization uh, of the, uh, of the uh, function, of the parsimony function uh, to, to minimize. Unfortunately, I don't have students to do that. Uh, now we took collection two independently. It got about 27,000 abstracts. Now it's from two publishers, Springer and Elsevier. Uh, it's based on queries and results are very similar. Uh, yeah. Results are very similar. So I don't want to, to bother. Now I'm going to tell you how the four different approaches would deal with the challenge, the challenge that provide a brief description of the content. The conventional content analysis is a method to summarize any quantitative uh, data in the content. It's, it's uh, mostly for comparisons. Say 27% of shows on radio days contained words on peace building, which is much more than it was in 2010. So this, uh, uh, this is the kind of, uh, th this is the, how this method operates. And of course you can do a, a number of, uh, a number of similar uh, conclusions, but they are all based on topics selected by the human. So content analysis, I think, cannot be used uh, for automating the brief description. Summarization, it's a, it's a technique to present a text that would be very short, summarize the longer text. Uh, in previous years, it was mostly extractive summarization. So just by selection of key sentences, key sentences in, in text and compiling them together. And of course, this cannot work for longer, for longer, uh, for uh, massive data. So currently we have abstractive summarization developing with deep learning for text embedding in vector spaces. This seems a very promising direction, but so far nothing, uh, oh no, almost nothing is, has been done 
uh, which uh, just some sporadic inventions here or there that uh, uh, no method as yet, uh, but this is a, a, a very interesting development in my view. Now, the citation analysis. So you have a, either a graph of mutual citation or co-citation. And basically such a graph, uh, the conclusions it brings, for instance, I, I just, it's a citation from a paper that developed cluster information at level, it found it. And this is how it described this information at level. You remember how we did describe it, that there is an image coming into existence and the issues of image factorization and so forth. Here, it shows that there are prominent members of the central members, this book by Selton and by Lisbergen, paper by Robertson, in themes and it identified in the citers of those. So the, the query expansion, heterogeneous thesauri, this type of things. So this, uh, 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 probably these themes could be used. This was done in 2010, much earlier, uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, uh, our approach is much more comprehensive. And at last, uh, the thematic modeling. So it's based on matrix factorization. So it uh, the topics are hidden and they are recovered by using word text relations. And unfortunately, these topics are very much empirical. For instance, for our subject, these are the topics and topics are basically sets of words. And in my view, uh, uh, it, it cannot match our results. So this is what we obtained in topic modeling applied. Uh, now, I would like to spend a, a, a minute to tell you that past year I had a few students that we analyzed with similar approach, 18,000 user reviews of restaurants and cafe in Moscow. Unfortunately, without any goal, nobody asked us to do that. And I personally don't much understand what should I do with this. So this uh, also cars, 35,000 user reviews of cars. So we developed a nice taxonomy for cars because I know a little bit of cars by myself. Uh, and also we took the journal of classification and analyzed it, its results uh, with respect to the contents of the journal advances in uh, statistics and classification, some in data analysis and classification. It's a competing journal also published by the Federation of Classification. And the results are quite good, but I don't think I can, I can uh, publish them because they are much critical of one journal. <laughs> and this is not uh, a way to do international science. Uh, okay. You have five minutes more, Boris. Well, I'm uh, concluding. Thank you. It's a, a page of my conclusion. So this method, taxonomic content analysis, explicitly involves the contents and structure of the taxonomy domain. 
it's a plus and minus simultaneously. Why it is plus? Because it involves accumulated wisdom. Uh, what is known to people about the, the domain. Why it is minus? Because not many domains have uh, developed taxonomies so far. I was trying to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, how to say, to appeal to the British research community that uh, they have a, what they call framework of excellence to, uh, to judge of, uh, to, to kind of evaluate. Uh, we have 80 departments of computer sciences in the United Kingdom. And to evaluate their successes, uh, every five, seven years, there is a kind of what they call exercise in, in the evaluation. So that should be done not by those uh, uh, commissions, but the co commissions based on a taxonomy of the computer science. Unfortunately, uh, the, the, this is, remains uh, absolutely unheard, un, 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 unheard of. Uh, so the original component here is this method for parsimonious lifting. And the, so far, if a domain has a good taxonomy, then this approach can be applied. If not, then no. Our personal work is developing this maximum likelihood in the more, like a more scientifically challenged, uh, charged, scientifically charged thing. And uh, uh, the optimal lifting can be used in other applications. For instance, in the analysis of history of uh, in phylogenetics and also in the targeted advertising over internet. It's uh, uh, experimentally proven that our approach to, to advise based on the general properties of clients uh, is much better uh, than the currently existing approaches. And with this, uh, I, I want to finish. Yeah. So the taxonomy is published in this preprint, which is publicly available in, in higher school of economics. And the paper uh, on the parsimonious generalization has been published past year in information sciences. And this is probably it. Thank you very much. Uh, I stopped the demonstration. I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Sorry, oh. sorry. Oh. yeah, yeah. I, I, sorry. Okay. Um, there is one question here from Salsabila Karin. Text mining is an artificial intelligence technology that uses natural language processing or NLP. NLP. The NLP is a language dependent system. Does the method that Professor American proposed also require adjustments? Just like uh, a per variable or parameter Thank suggestion. You. I, I, uh, I understand. In Indonesian abstract, no, it's quite interesting. Okay. I understand the question. Okay. I do not use NLP. Mm. I do not do NLP. I do not do uh, uh, the structures of sentences, whatever. I use purely syntactic approach. I take only strings and substrings. And since the Indonesian language, as far as I know, is based on linear, <laughs> it uses Latin, <coughs> uh, uh, an updated, uh, a modified Latin alphabet, 
and uh, linear structure. So we can use substrings and apply this technique with no, uh, with no adjustment for the language part. Okay. Okay, thank you for the questions. Any other question, please uh, write in the chat box. No, there is no questions. Yeah. Oh, there is, uh, uh, no, there is a. Uh, uh, in ah, there is other questions. I will read it from Professor Budi Nurani from Mathematics Department. Professor Boris. Oh, it's a question. I've got a question here in the chat. Okay. May I? Uh, so, uh, would you like to explain more in using the maximum likelihood in the problem of optimal lifting? Thanks. Okay. So we have now two, so, so the maximum likelihood is the very same criterion uh, which uses not gamma and lambda, but rather probabilities of gain and loss at every node. So I can re rewrite this criterion, which I did not explain, so I don't, I'm not going to explain the maximum likelihood criterion just a very similar additive criterion for every node uh, computing the probability of events based on the probability. So, so uh, the, the, sorry, the issue is that we are going to reconstruct the history of a concept. So, so the cluster ex that we are going to generalize expresses a concept. So for this concept, at every node, we assume a probability of gain and loss of this concept. Sorry, it's two different events, a probability of gain and probability of loss at this moment. So now we are going to optimally reconstruct these events based on these probabilities. We assume that these probabilities are given. And the very same algorithm modified accordingly works here. Now the issue is where could we get, get the probabilities of gain and loss at every node. And we have two approaches. One approach, we take Google, a uh, 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 scholar. The scholars. That comprises, I don't know how many, 10 million or 10 billion of uh, research papers published. And we look at, say we take a concept uh, corresponding to a node, in, in, uh, in the taxonomy and a concept corresponding to each child. And we ask Google the query, two queries related to the concept and to the child. And Google gives us billions of pages. <clears throat> First it gives, we don't need to look at the contents. We just look at the numbers it supplies. And based on these numbers, now we can ask, uh, we, we can make a query consisting of both concepts. So in this way, we get frequencies of the, uh, uh, of the combined concepts and the, the, the concepts. And based on this, also we can, uh, uh, how to say, we can postulate that say more than two concepts never can occur. And based on this, we can derive the probabilities. And the second approach, which we consider, well, the second approach is this. We apply maximum parsimony principle to random subsamples of our text on the same taxonomy. And in this way, we get a number of events near every vertex, every node in the taxonomy. So if we did it a thousand times, we get a thousand of events. And from these events, we can derive the probabilities. And we are uh, going to explore both ways. Okay. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Uh, because uh, we have limited time. Uh, there is one question. I come to my uh, watch up uh, chat. No, it not in the chat. Uh, my, one of my colleagues, is going to research in content analysis. 
would you like to be contacted to discuss the the research about context analysis from our graduate students? Oh, of course, of course. Okay, thank you. If, yep. if I don't, if I, I will send you email down, for I that. Okay. Say that I can as well, but maybe okay. I can. I don't know. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. this is the end of the presentation, and I will hand it the 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 press the session to Marsha for uh, awarding certificate from the committee. Please, Marcia. Thank you, Mr. Setiawan. Uh, firstly, I, I would like to thank Mr. Baris for the presentation. The committee has prepared a certificate of appreciation for you, and we will have a documentation session with you along with the certificate. I think the committee can help me spotlight Mr. Baris and the certificate. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Okay, I think I will I come understand. down from three, and I will take a screenshot. Okay. Uh, I will start in three, two, one. Okay, did the documentation team got the picture? Okay, I guess the documentation team has already screenshot. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Boris for the time and presentation. I hope you have a great day ahead and stay healthy and God bless you, sir. We'll proceed to our next second keynote speaker. We will, we will proceed to our second keynote speaker. I want to invite again Dr. Satyawan Hadi to join me here again as the moderator. Please, uh, Pastor Satyawan. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you, Boris. Nice to talk. Nice to meet you. And it is, you give a nice talk. And maybe you will be contacted about uh, the research of my graduate. Okay, the much. next... Okay, the next presenter, the next presenter is Dr. Mahardika Pratama. Um, okay, it's uh, already there. Dr. Mahardika Pratama will give a talk entitled Continual and Autonomous Machine Learning. Before presentation, I will read the curriculum vitae. Dr. Mahardika Pratama is an assistant professor at School of CSA or Computer Science of Engineering, if I'm not mistaken, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore from 2017. His research interest encompasses continual learning, data stream, data stream mining, fuzzy machine, and so on. He has led a special issue on autonomous machine learning in information sciences and a workshop in AML in ICDM 2019. Dr. Pratama currently serves as an associate editor in numerous top journals, IEEE, TFS, Information Sciences, and so on. He was a program chair for INNS BDDL 2019 and local chair ICBK 2019. During his career, Dr. Pratama secured up to $3 million in research funding. He has graduated six PhD students to completion in timely fashion and seek postdoctoral research fellows. Because of his excellent research work, he received IEEE TFS prestigious publication award in 2019 and Amity Researcher Award in Data Streams 2019. Last but not least, this achievement is attained only six years after Dr. Pratama obtained his PhD from UNSW in 2014. Here, We, we will hear the presentation of Dr. Mahardat Mardika Pratama. The time is yours. I'm your host. Stiawan Hadi will be your host, the moderator. Thank you. Time Thank is you yours. Much. Thank you very much, Dr. Stiawan, for the nice introduction. First of all, uh, indeed, I would like to thank the committee for inviting me to give a talk today. Uh, it is my, my honor to share my research with you today. Uh, I, I will share, share my screen. Uh, can it be seen? Yes. My yes. slide? Yeah, great. Okay. Thank you very much. So today I'm going to present my research in the area of continual and autonomous learning machine. The motivation behind our research is to address the problem of data stream. Now we deal with a uh, data stream. We don't deal with data set anymore. Uh, dealing with data stream is not easy because of number of challenges, unbounded, continuously generated data, uh, 
data has to be processed in timely fashion. And also there is a restrictive processing time and bounded memory. And importantly, data stream don't follow static and predictable concept. However, data distribution are changing and it has non-stationary environment. So how to handle with this uh, problem? In the past, uh, we are not the first one to handle the data stream problem. There are many other works. However, uh, most work are designed under traditional machine learning framework. How about deep learning? Deep learning has been proven to be better than state of the art uh, uh, than, than many other classical machine learning algorithms. However, deep learning has not been used that much to handle data streams. The problem is that deep learning has rigid structure that is impossible to adapt to changing environments. So in that case, the key research question is that how to make deep learning algorithms self-evolving in response to concept drift or changing data distribution. Uh, we know that in the concept of a fuzzy system, we can interpret fuzzy rule as a cluster. Mm -hmm. As a result, we can use clustering algorithm, online clustering algorithm to uh, create, to extract fuzzy rules automatically. So in the presence of concept drift, fuzzy rule can be added and so on. However, in the deep learning environment, it is not possible because hidden node doesn't correspond to a cluster. It doesn't have any local information. However, we know that any machine learning algorithm has what we call bias and variance straight off. There is an underfitting zone, there is an overfitting zone. If uh, the model is underfitting, means that the model is not complex enough, so we need to increase the capacity of the model. If the model is too complex, so meaning that the model is overfitting, then we need to uh, reduce the capacity of the neural network. So if we can estimate bias and variance in the online manner, online manner here means we process the data in single pass. So once we train the model with a data point, data point are directly discarded because we deal with infinite amount of data that stream over time. So we want to have bounded memory complexity as well as low uh, computational complexity as well. So we need to process it in the single pass learning environment. So that's why this uh, issue inspired us to uh, develop elastic deep learning algorithm handling evolving data stream without catastrophic forgetting, intensive user intervention and slow execution time. Beside feature of the algorithms that we should have uh, structural learning capability where the structure can be built automatically from scratch. It has no initial structure. It can be without initial structure or we can, it can start from some predefined structure. And then uh, one pass learning fashion and flexible elastic structure, adjustable network depth and adjustable network width. Uh, the first work that we propose to handle this problem is called Nadine. Nadine can handle both data stream regression as well as classification. This work has been published in CIKM 2019. And Nadine is built upon MLP, multi-layer perceptron structure. However, there is a problem. It is not easy to evolve MLP, especially when we add a new layer. However, addition of new layer is desirable because we can increase the capacity of neural network much more than addition of node. However, whenever we add a new layer, this layer will be inserted as a last layer. As a result, we lose performance. So and in addition to that, we also derive some methods to grow uh, the structure of uh, deep neural network. We call our approach as network significance method. So it is based on online estimation of bias and variance. So this is our numerical result. We can see here we have compared Nadine with uh, state-of-the-art algorithms in data streams. And the performance is satisfactory in both uh, classification as well as regression. 
And this is the illustration, uh, the visualization of how nadine perform. Surprisingly, whenever uh, we change the structure of nadine, the performance doesn't drop. And this addition of node um, layer and so on happen in response to uh, performance drop as a result of concept drift. So uh, there is a demo, but I think I just skipped that. We also have other work that deal with similar issue, but under different structure. First work we call we call it ADL, autonomous deep learning. This use uh, different depth network structure. So every layer has its own local output. And the second work that I present here is the under the concept of recurrent neural network because data stream indeed has temporal characteristic. How can we uh, incorporate temporal information to uh, predict uh, data stream accur accurately? Uh, these two work has been published in SDM as well as ICDM 2019. Now, another problem of data stream that is significant is the problem of labeling cost. You can imagine if we deal with real-time real -time system, data come over time from sensor, it is impossible to station an operator to label all those data points. In other words, we want to have an algorithm that can work in the weekly supervised environment, meaning that the label is scarce. We define two condition of weekly supervised data stream. The first condition we call it as sporadic access to the ground truth, where the label come in the sporadic fashion. The second one is more extreme, where the label is only available in the initialization phase or warm up phase and the rest come without any label. So how can we adapt our model using unlabeled samples? And this is the problem with data stream where the concept change over time. So in that case, we need to update our model continuously using unlabeled data. So uh, our approach to this, we call uh, our approach as ParseNet, parsimonious network. And um, this approach has been published in Iterable Big Data 2019. <clears throat> and then here, uh, if you are familiar with discriminative and generative training phase, we couple between discriminative and dis uh, generative training phase, where in each phase, there is hidden node growing and pruning. In addition to that, we also design a, a regularization mechanism where we label unlabeled data point using the prediction of the model itself. However, this is pseudo label, we call it pseudo label. This pseudo label may be noisy. So that's why we ha have regularization mechanism to avoid the influence, to reduce the influence of noisy label. And here we test ParseNet in uh, many cases and compare it with state of the art algorithm like LAN++, LAN++ NSE or online multi-class boosting and so on. And we find that our algorithm achieves a performance improvement uh, with up to 21.46%. And in the infinity delay problem, we also uh, outperform state of the art algorithms. This is the visualization I just gave. Uh, we also, uh, the problem of weekly, uh, weekly supervised data stream can be thought also as the problem of labeling delay. We have a data point, but it uh, requires need some time to label this data point. So, so as a result, label is delayed. So to handle with this problem, we have a solution as well. Under recurrent neural network, we design skip connection in the recurrent neural network and we published this work in KDD 2020 and AAAI 2020. Now, another problem data stream that we handle in the past is called many data streams. You can imagine uh, we work quite a lot in the area of condition monitoring, uh, um, quality classification, and so on. In that case, in the manufacturing subfloor, there are many machines. If we have to build an independent model for each machine, then the complexity will be very high. So our approach is that we just deploy a single model that can be adapted, that can be adapted to different machine. And because 
this is data. This data come from sensor. This is data stream problem. That's why uh, this problem, we call it many data streams. We have a source stream and we have a target stream. Source stream has a label, but target stream has no label at all. As a result, of course, because this stream run independently, there is a concept drift in the source stream and there is concept drift in the target stream. And this concept drift are unsynchronous. So meaning that they take place at different time points. So uh, we propose a solution for that. Uh, we call our approach autonomous transfer learning. And uh, this approach is published in CIKM 2019. And in ATL, we uh, address this problem using encoder decoder structure. And we also utilize scale divergent and minimize the scale divergent loss to, uh, to, 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 to minimize uh, divergence between source stream and target stream. In this case, the distribution in the source stream and target stream are different because they are two different streams. And then here, uh, this is our result. And uh, you can see that ADL can achieve comparable accuracy with much less computational time than state-of-the-art algorithms. Okay, and here you can see the performance of the source uh, showing in the red, as well as in the target showing in the blue. They are very close to each other, meaning that the model can handle both stream equally well. Okay, I just skip. Another problem of data stream that we handle is what we call many data, uh, sorry, large scale data stream. Large scale data stream refer to a problem where size of stream is very large so that it is not scalable to be processed under scalable uh, computing environment. So it is not like, it is. it can be seen as extension of big data problem. Big data problem, however, just we just have one single data that is very big. But here in data stream is that we have continuous information flow where each flow is very big. In that case, we need to uh, integrate distributed computing strategy. In this case, we design our algorithm under the uh, framework of Apache Spark. And uh, this is dis distributed model. And um, as a result, we need to uh, have a model fusion strategy and then aggregation step to produce um, the final prediction. And this work has been published recently in 2019 in Information Sciences. Uh, and yeah, this is the schematic. I don't go into detail with this because I want to talk about continual learning later on. Uh, that can be seen as an uh, extension of data stream problem. Uh, here, uh, because in the large scale data stream, the labeling cost is very high. So in that case, we design our approach for a semi-supervised learning. And we can see that this scatternet produce comparable accuracy with only 25% label. Uh, and also uh, here the uh, conference paper that work in the uh, supervised manner. And this is a, a, a work uh, that we designed, but this is not dealing with continual environment. So meaning that we only deal with a single stream. Okay, now how about application? We uh, have applied our work to different problem, especially in the manufacturing problem because of the funding that we receive. So we apply our work uh, in machine health monitoring, tool condition monitoring, quality classification, and so on. And this is example where we apply our algorithm for 3D printing. So we detect the nozzle of 3D printer, the condition, and this is streaming problem. And uh, also to predict uh, quality of the product. This is injection molding that we use in our experiment. Okay, now, um, well, one may wonder whether this kind of adaptive structured system is stable. That's why we try to um, figure out this and apply our algorithm to control problem. In the control problem, uh, there is slight different. The learning law has to be developed from uh, control concept rather than machine learning concept. 
uh, we propose a controller and apply it to uh, UAV. And uh, this work is published in Information Sciences. This is neurophasy system that we call PAC, parsimonious control. And uh, uh, there is a video here, but I just skipped. I recently, we extend this work uh, with deep neural network. And we published this work in ITRA 2021. And uh, yeah, so I run the video I, to give you better illustration. A static deep neural network cannot handle with uh, external disturbance, like wind gas in this example. And then it cannot deal with different flight mission. Okay, so if you want to uh, tackle different flight mission, we need to have retuning phase. However, how about if you want to deal with those different mission continually? You can see here this first mission flying under windy condition. The left hand side is actually TNN, and on the right hand side is our controller. You can see that our controller is much uh, give smaller error. Uh, this is illustration as well. Without any further tuning, we directly apply our controller to the second case. And here we can see that our controller uh, perform much better than static controller, static deep neural network controller on the left hand side. Okay, so you can see that the left hand side cannot reach desired altitude level. Yeah, so uh, just speed up. Okay, now uh, this is our industry partner that support our research. Now, what I want to talk today mainly is about continual learning. Continual learning is very popular nowadays. Uh, many top conferences publish a lot of paper about continual learning because it is very important. We as human beings, we always learn a new thing in our life. When we learn a new thing, we don't forget what we already learned in the past. And our experience determine how good we are in, in learning the current thing. If we are more experienced, then probably it is easier for us to learn the new things. However, it is not the case of deep neural network or any machine learning algorithm. Why? Because machine learning algorithm suffer from catastrophic forgetting problem. Uh, we can see the case of a baby. Uh, a baby, you know, when uh, he or she learn how to recognize a cat, how to recognize a dog, how to recognize a cow, and how to recognize a horse. And at the end, he or she can recognize all these objects very well. However, if we apply this to deep neural network, deep neural network only recognize the last uh, seen object. But older objects are forgotten. So that's why this limit capability of deep neural network or machine learning to be applied in the continual learning environment. Data stream that I just um, mentioned refer to the case of, uh, can be seen as simple, ex simple example of continual learning. Because here we only deal with a single task. However, if you talk about continual learning, we are talking about different tasks. It can be each task different data set. So in that case, how to deal with this situation? So in other words, tasks are received in sequence. The total number of tasks is unknown because uh, we always learn new thing in our life. So we hope that deep, le uh, deep learning can um, follow the same thing. And at any given time, at any given time, only the current task is accessible. We don't have access to the data of the previous task. Knowledge is transferred from previously learned task forward transfer, and current task should improve understanding of the whole task, or what we call it as backward transfer. Challenges, I already mentioned, catastrophic forgetting. We need to quickly adapt to a new environment because uh, this has to be to, to be has to happen seamlessly. All right, we cannot you know, uh, tune our parameter again, right? So it has to happen in the continual manner. Computational and memory constraint, uh, 
uh, data of the current task only is accessible. The old data are not accessible. Total number of tasks is unknown. We don't know the total number of tasks. New instant problem where we have the same data, but with different distribution. Or we have new class problem where we deal with different problems. So if every task uh, each of different classes. So how to handle with this problem? In the literature, there are three different approaches to handle with this problem. We call it regularization problem, memory problem, uh, memory regularization approach, memory approach, and architecture-based approach. And for memory-based approach, what it does is that it store old samples of the old tasks. And, even, and then whenever we learn a new task, then this old sample are replayed along with the new data. So in that case, catastrophic forgetting is minimized. It is also possible to use generative models instead of storing the real data. So in that case, we can use, um, again, we can use variational autoencoder to generate uh, pseudo samples of all tasks. And then here, the advantage of this approach is that the performance is strong in the, memo in the memory based approach. Um, it is also free of task ID. We don't need to know from which task a data point come from. And we don't, we don't need to also know the task boundaries, meaning that the transition between uh, one task to another task uh, doesn't have to be informed to the model. Disadvantage, it requires hundreds or thousands of samples to be stored per class. So if we are under, uh, you know, limited computational budget, then this approach uh, may not be a wise solution. Architecture-based approach. For architecture-based approach is that it expands the network structure to deal with new tasks. Well, we can blindly expand. Uh, whenever you know new tasks come, we can add new network, new layer, or whatever, right? Or we can, um, you know, reconfigure the structure of the network using a method like uh, architecture search method like Nash or uh, evolutionary computation-based approach to find the best structure for new tasks. It is flexible approach, however, it, uh, and also it determines automatically the network capacity that is best for the problem. However, it is computationally prohibitive. Why? Because architecture search algorithm is very, very computationally prohibitive. The last approach is called regularization based approach. This approach is very simple, right? Because it just estimate, it estimate the importance of the parameter for the old task. And then important parameters are, uh, are given high regularization so that when it learn a new task, it is not affected that much. As, as a result, the model doesn't suffer from catastrophic forgetting. It is easy to implement, pass, you know, however, this problem doesn't scale well for large scale problems. Doesn't scale well for large scale. Problems. What happened is that whenever there is a new, uh, whenever there is a new task, then we need to estimate the importance of network parameters. And then for different tasks, we need to accumulate this uh, parameter important metric. So as a result, if we deal with high number of uh, tasks, the parameter important metrics will become very large and we can uh, see unlearning effect. So at the end, uh, network, network deep learning model doesn't learn anything because you know all the parameter has been used for the previous task. So that's why uh, there is scalability issue for regularization based approach. So uh, we uh, offer an alternative or you know 
an enhancement of each, uh, of regularization based approach. We develop a method uh, based on regularization. Uh, we use regularization principle here uh, that we call Ishiana Intertask Synaptic Mapping. It is regularization based approach uh, and it try to improve the scalability of uh, regularization based approach. It consider intertask relationship allowing common information to be identified. So we are interested to find common information between tasks so that an, a node or parameter of a network can be shared across different tasks. As a result, if a node is, is shareable across different tasks, so in that case, we can scale the regularization based approach better to deal with uh, large scale continual learning problem. And uh, it is based on dual mapping strategy. We, we, we have task to task mapping that check how relevant the current task to the previous task. If this that we find two tasks are relevant, then we need to learn it to learn it. If two tasks are not relevant, then we should not learn it. A node cannot should not learn it. And we can control whether or not a node learn something from the learning rate. We can set high learning rate for relevant tasks and low learning rate for irrelevant tasks. Okay. And then we also have uh, what we call synaptic to task uh, mapping. Synaptic to task mapping aims to check whether this node is relevant to the current task or not. And then we combine these two information and uh, yeah, this approach has been published in KPS 2021, just this year. And we form task-to-task uh, -task mapping and synaptic task mapping as linear combination to each other. And then we apply this information to set the learning rate of the model of a node. Okay, how to check the synaptic to task mapping? We can check how relevant a node to the current task by simply calculating the mutual information. So I is the information gain, H here is the entropy. And then if we, uh, uh, here we apply differential entropy uh, that assume data are normally distributed. And then we can calculate this uh, and find ST. And the second one to measure task to task mapping, uh, to measure how relevant a task to the previous task, then um, we use KL divergence. Uh, in that case though, uh, because data that we handle are image data, which is of high dimension. So in that case, we need to apply uh, neural network as a dimensionality redux uh, reduction approach. And then we can calculate the KL divergence between the current task to the previous task. And then based on this information, then we can combine ST and TT and uh, control the learning rate of our model. Okay, now in continual learning, what happened is that the simulation protocol is done, uh, for example, if we have five tasks, then we need to learn task one, task two, task three, task four, task five, and then we test our model for task one, test our model for task two, that's our model for task three, task four, and task five. So this is the simulation protocol. And we test our method uh, in several problems, split amnish problem, rotated amnish problem, permuted amnish problem, and omniclot. Okay, for uh, evaluation metric, we use uh, three measures, accuracy, backward transfer, forward transfer. We compare with state-of-the-art algorithm, HDG, EWC, online EWC, and so on, until HM. Okay, and now this is our approach. You can see in split MNIS, our performance is comparable, not better than state-of-the-art algorithm. However, uh, split MNIS only consists of five tasks. For permuted MNIS, we are better, better than state-of-the-art algorithms. Yeah, we can see Ishiana, our algorithm. And in terms of forward transfer as well as backward transfer, our approach is also better. 
okay and for rotated MNIST problem we are comparable to uh, state of the art algorithm now the main challenge is in the omniclot problem uh, to confirm our hypothesis because we want to improve scalability of the regularization based approach omniclot consists of 50 tasks 50 tasks 50 tasks and um, as a result, here regularization based method like EWC, OEWC, DGR, LWF performance is very low, just only 10%. And our approach can scale very well with this problem, 35, just behind HM. However, HM here is memory based approach. So it, it relies on some past sample to handle catastrophic forgetting. Our approach, on the other hand, we don't rely on any uh, uh, memory data. We don't rely on any memory. So uh, in that case, uh, yeah, we, we are, we are um, the performance is, is, is competitive in this case. And a pleasant study, we try, um, how about if we switch off PT? And uh, as a result, in the omnicloud problem, the performance of each genre is significantly compromised by only, uh, you know, it achieved 10% accuracy. Now, the next problem that we handle is unsupervised continual learning problem. Again, this deal with limited label problem. In the unsupervised continual learning problem, we only assume that data is available in the initialization phase or the first batch. The rest of data are unlabeled. How to handle with this problem is something that we want to handle. And again, this is different from data stream because every task are different. Every task are different to each other. Okay, so our motivation is that most approach of fully supervised in nature, most approach depend on the task ID, uh, meaning that we need to know Okay, this sample come from which task? Most approach ignore intra-task variation, meaning that in each task, it's assumed that this task don't change or follow IIT condition. Most approach overly rely on the task boundary, meaning that the transition between one task to another task has to be informed to the model. So here we propose a Kiera, we call it Knowledge retention in self adaptive deep continual learner. And Kiera is published in Ichikai Workshop on continual and semi supervised learning. Uh, it is based on deep clustering approach. In that case, uh, we utilize deep neural network and perform the clustering process in the latent space of the deep neural network. In this context, because we want to perform clustering in the latent space, so what we need to do is that we need to make sure that the um, latent space is clustering friendly. So how to uh, make the latent space uh, clustering friendly is something that we need to handle. And as well as the network should have uh, self-evolving characteristic in order to respond to different tax complexity, changing environment, and so on. And then to handle um, Catastrophic forgetting, we use centroid based experience replay method. Okay, so here is the illustration of our method. So we have feature extractor and then we have stack auto encoder. In every hidden layer, as I mentioned, we apply self clustering. And here our method is fully evolvable, meaning that hidden nodes, hidden layer, hidden cluster are evolving. Okay, inference process is done like this. Uh, well, uh, a lot of math here, so I think I just uh, explain it briefly. So what happened is that we have the concept of cluster allergen where we uh, measure the relationship between a cluster and a task, so, uh, a cluster and a class. So as a result, we can see um, a cluster belongs to which class. So. Uh, and after we do that, we aggregate this information and take the final predicted model, our final predicted uh, label yeah, from L number of layer that we have. And here, uh, layer, node, 
cluster are evolvable. So this is a learning policy. We have network depth adaptation, network width adaptation, parameters update, as well as um, uh, ad adaptation of cluster, meaning that cluster can be added and pruned. Okay, so this is condition to add new hidden node. Uh, I already mentioned briefly before that we develop a method to calculate the bias and variance of the network on the fly. And once we calculate the bias and the variance, we use SPC, statistical process control approach, modified SPC uh, to grow or prune the network. SPC is a method that we use, that people use for anomaly detection. So here we apply SPC to detect high bias condition or high variance condition. And then we use concept drift detection to um, identify whether or not drift is present in the data. And then if there is a drift, then we add a new layer. If there is no drift, then we just update the parameter of the model. And then evolution of hidden cluster, meaning that the cluster are automatically added. So here, based on just a distance measure, if a distance between a sample and a cluster is far, then we add in the cluster. And this is the update formula. Here, we use hard, cluster, hard assignment approach, meaning that only the winning hidden we only the winning cluster are, is updated. Only the winning cluster is updated. However, now, you know, um, in the literature, some people also offer soft assignment approach where all clusters are updated using back, back propagation. And this is the loss function. As I mentioned earlier, that we need to have clustering friendly latent space. So, this is uh, the loss function that we apply to induce clustering plainly latent space. You can see that HL is the latent sample. Latent sample is forced to be close to the centroid of the winning cluster or the closest cluster. So as a result, every sample will have high coverage. So this is the record structure loss and this, this is a reconstruction loss combined with the clustering loss. And we can see here that this one is updated end to end, and this one is updated um, uh, in the greedy layer wise fashion. So meaning that we update per layer. Okay, and now how to update, uh, how to avoid catastrophic forgetting, we apply centroid space experience replay. What happened is that whenever, uh, whenever we grow a new cluster, we consider those points as focal points, as a focal points, and we store that in the episodic memory. However, if we rely on all the sample, right, uh, the size of the memory will be very large. That's the first one, and second one. Uh, we don't know which sample are actually the most forgotten one. So that's why we uh, introduce the concept of the most forgotten sample. So meaning that we only replay the sample which is uh, the most forgotten. So as a result, we can reduce the size of the memory. Uh, the size of the replay buffer, meaning that the size of the memory and the samples that we use in the experience replay have different size, have different size. Um, we test our approach in split MNIST, rotated MNIST, permuted MNIST, and CVAR10. And uh, we uh, compare our approach with STAN, DCN, uh, DCN is Deep Clustering Network, plus LWF, Learning Without Forgetting, this one, uh, and also we have DCN plus SI, and then here we have AE uh, auto encoder plus K means plus LWF, and we have AE plus K means plus SI. And um, uh, we can see here that our approach are pretty competitive. We win in two cases and lose in two cases against STEM. Uh, STEM is recently published approach in each guy, 
uh, uh, tissue. And uh, we can see here that um, in rotated, rotated MDs within, uh, permuted MDs within, and then in the uh, CVAR, split CVAR10, we also win compared to other algorithms. And uh, this is just the number of nodes, number of layer, number of cluster, and number of memory. Okay, and this is the memory evolution. You can see that if we rely only on the focal points, or the size of the memory grow more rapidly than the size of replay buffer. Here, the red is the sample that we actually replay, the size of the sample that we actually replay. And it is much less. So as a result, uh, we can reduce the size of the memory. And this is for CPAR 10 problem. And uh, the number of samples that we replay is around 600 plus. And 600 plus, in this case, if we assume that uh, CPAR 10 has 10 classes, so in that case, we only store 60 uh, sample per class. OK, so yeah. Uh, that's about all from me and um, most of this algorithm uh, all this uh, most of this algorithm have the code available online so you can try try it out if you are interested and want to go deeper uh, in our github page yeah i think uh, that's all okay uh, thank you very much thank you, thank you. mr mahardika uh, now we come into uh, question and answers. Audience or participants, please write your uh, questions in the chat box. Um, maybe uh, Dr. Mardika can read directly to the chat box. There is one question. Oh, yeah. I saw one of the slides, uh, flexible DNA algorithm to handle many data, or many data streams. What does flexibility mean here? and how the flexibility can handle many data streams. Okay, I already mentioned that in the data stream, in many data stream concept, there is a problem that we call asynchronous drift, meaning that the concept drift happen in the source stream as well as in the target stream. And this drift happen at different times. So how to handle with this problem? So what we offer is that we have flexible structure, meaning that whenever there is a drift in the source stream, we can evolve our model based on the predictive error because we learn in the predictive fashion. In this case, the source stream uh, has a label. And then whenever there is a drift in the target stream where there is no label at all, we evolve our model as well, but we evolve it based on reconstruction error. So yeah, so flexibility in this case is how to handle a drift. Because whenever there is a drift, then uh, the performance of the model will suffer. However, how to quickly recover from the drift, that is the most important. So meaning that in the next batch, we can directly learn, quickly transfer our model to a new environment. So yeah, I hope it answers your question. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, is there any question? Okay, the second one. Can we apply a constraint such as constraint on network size or network depth? In our approach, we don't apply any threshold in terms of maximum number. So normally, the network is bounded, meaning that it produces a network with limited size. With limited size, it, is, it doesn't explode. It doesn't explode. So that is in our case, because logically it growing and pruning process in, in any model should be bounded if the criteria is correct. If the criteria is not correct, then both model will explode. Meaning that you, we need to evolve the model on demand, on demand. Whenever there is a need to grow, then we grow. If there is no need to grow, then we don't grow. So, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, uh, one point. And another point, uh, uh, you know, structural learning or architecture learning, whatever you, we call it, uh, 
there are other approach as well. Um, for example, if you see literature about Nash, neural arch arch architecture search, they limit the number of layers. So meaning that we don't have any hidden layer growing process. And it is optimization based approach, meaning that uh, you know, computational complexity is higher. That therefore, normally Nash will produce higher accuracy, but the computational complexity is very expensive. Our approach, on the other hand, we probably not as good as NAS in terms of accuracy. However, in terms of complexity, time complexity, we will definitely lower than NAS because we are data-driven approach. Yeah, so I think this can uh, clarify your question. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Mahardika. Yeah. We, says we still have time. Uh, Probably there is, is there any questions? Please write down on the chat box. So yeah, probably any question. <laughs> uh, we are happy to uh, discuss with you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, it's great presentation, uh, Dr. Mardika. It's quite interesting. You're working in the stream data, right? Not the data sets. That that's quite interesting because the test streams uh, may be large as in size and it took a uh, lot of time to label. I mean, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Stevan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Any questions? If there is no question, I think uh, we can finish our uh, discussion or presentation. Uh, I handed the presentation, uh, the session to the Mars to Marcia. Uh, that will uh, uh, give you a award or certificate. Okay, please, Marcia. Okay, firstly, thank you to all the speakers, especially our second keynote speaker, Dr. Mahardiga Pratama, for the very insightful material. And thank you, Mr. Satyawan Hadi, for guiding the discussion on today's session, which was really impressive. Certificate of Appreciation will be presented by me as the Master of Ceremony for, uh, for today's event to our, speak for our, to our second keynote speaker, Dr. Mahardika Pratama. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we will start the documentation. Like before, I will count down from three. Are the committee ready to take a screenshot? Okay, I think they're ready. I will count down from three. Uh, we'll start three, two, one. Okay, thank you for the documentation committee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahardika Pratama for the presentation. I hope you have a great day ahead and God bless. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Marsha. You're welcome. We also would like to give certificate of appreciation to Dr. Satyawan Hadi MSCCS as our moderator today. I think the committee can help me spotlight Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Satyawan Hadi, for being the moderator for today's session with our speakers. I think we will start the documentation. I will count down from three. We'll start from now. Three, two, one. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Satyawan Hadi. You're welcome. I want to thank our speakers and moderator, and of course, all of our participants for your enthusiasm and participation that you took in today's event. We are almost at the end of this session, which is the day one of International Conference on Artificial Intelligence and Big Data Analytics, ICA IBDA 2021. I also want to inform to all the participants that we will have another event tomorrow at ICA IBDA 2021 day two. And before we proceed to the attendance form filling and parallel session, I would like to encourage all of you to turn on your camera because we will have a documentation or photo session. Okay, thank you for those who already opened their cameras. To those who haven't turned their camera on, please kindly turn on the camera so that we can have a documentation session.
Okay, I think since most of you already opened the camera, I think we will begin our documentation session. I will count down again in three. We'll start now. I hope the documentation team is ready. Okay, I will count down from now. Three, two, one. Okay, next for slide two. Three, two, one. Slide three, three, two, and one. And last to slide four, three, two, one. Okay, thank you to all the participants who already turned their cameras on. Coming up to the last session, uh, before the last session, I think the committee will share an attendance form in the chat box below. To all participants, please fill the attendance form on the chat box below because we will close this session soon. Coming up to the last session, I would like to inform that after this, we will have uh, to proceed to the parallel session in breakout rooms for the presenters. Participants are allowed to, so feel free to join the breakout room. So please wait as you will be directed to join the breakout rooms. If somehow some of you are having difficulties in joining the breakout room, please kindly inform the committee. Lastly, on behalf of the committee, I would like to thank you for the participation and I would like to apologize if there are any shortcomings in the implementations of today's session. I want to encourage all the participants to fill in the feedback form on the chat box below as well. The committee will share it in the chat box below. So I am Marcia Stephanie Manuro. See you tomorrow on ICA IBDA 2021 day two. I hope you have a great parallel session right after this one. Good afternoon and have a great day.
For the presenters who hasn't joined the breakout room, please kindly join the breakout room now since the session will start soon. And for all the participants who want to join the breakout room to watch the presenters, you are free to go. Thank you.